and third anniversary of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, an industrial disaster that changed a great deal in American history, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that. That I want you to keep in mind, and, and I'll talk about this at the end, uh, that this is a very contemporary issue. That uh, as we speak, and if you look at the labels on your clothes, uh, many of us are wearing things that were made today under similar conditions uh, in Bangladesh in particular. Uh, and on the 100th anniversary of the Triangle Fire, um, the leader of the Bangladesh Garment Workers Movement, Kaplona Akhtar, came to the United States and one of the first things she said was, today, where your clothes are made in Bangladesh, it is 1911, it's not 2011. Even though this you know, is putatively a history talk, uh, it's actually a talk about the conditions under which our clothes are made today. We just can't see it. And one of the most important things about Triangle and one of the reasons why it captured the attention of the nation was because it took place in New York City in the midst of what was then and perhaps is now still the, you know, the most densely populated media market in the world. And uh, that captured attention sufficient to have a funeral, a funeral march watched by f between four and 500,000 people. We can't see what happens in Bangladesh, but I'll show you some pictures because uh, it's, it's really not very different at all. It's just not covered in, in our media today. So, to talk about Triangle then involves going back to New York City at the turn of the century in the last major wave uh, of immigration to the United States. I, I want to point out that the 1880s, 1890s are often thought of as the golden uh, era of immigration and the period of greatest um, influx of people from all around the world to the United States. In fact, the 1990s brought an even greater number of people to the U.S. So these immigrant issues also um, are very contemporary. The Lower East Side, uh, early 20th century, where um, Triangle was. And uh, the Lower East Side, uh, at the turn of the 20th century, was the most densely populated square mile on Earth. And that included certain neighborhoods in Beijing that gave it a run for the money. But it was uh, populated from the top into the basement of those buildings with people living everywhere from coal cellars to bathtubs. And this was as a result of uh, something between 1880 and 1924, something close to uh, 25 million people coming into the United States, which had a population of little more than 30 million uh, in the, after the Civil War when the migration era started. You have a sense there from looking at these buildings. If you can see, um, the buildings in the upper left are wood. And if you have um, a community that's that densely populated, right, and you have wooden buildings in New York, it's cold in the winter, it doesn't get as cold as Vermont, but it gets cold and damp. Um, there were lots of possibilities for fires. So fires, and, and in many of those wooden buildings at that point, there still were not, um, there still was not indoor plumbing. So uh, early 20th century, the danger of fire was constant. And, um, and when fires came, uh, they were devastating. This particular uh, street scene gives you a sense of uh, the way also people marketed, right? You had, um, you had lots of folks in the street, lots of folks who were um, like immigrant vendors at this, you know, at this time, not a lot of capital, didn't have money to rent the store, selling whatever they could on, on the streets. So things were very, very, very crowded um, at all times. Uh, Sewage was inadequate, the, the system to dispose of it. Uh, cholera was a problem every summer. It was, uh, it was very difficult living conditions in those years. In the early 20th century, the way most of those immigrants made their living, uh, at least most of the East European Jewish immigrants and Italian immigrants who came from um, the pale of Jewish settlement, what is now Poland and uh, and Lithuania and parts of Russia um, to the United States, but also uh, Italians from southern Italy, the way most of them made the living, also a small number of uh, native-born white Protestants, Irish 
working women and, um, and a very few African-American women was in the new ready-to-wear clothing industry. So, uh, you know, before that, mostly clothes were made in, uh, in the house. Uh, there was still a good number of people working in the house doing piecework, but you began to get more modern factories. Right? You started out with, with sweatshops. And, um, and by sweatshops, I, I mean whatever room somebody could rent. Right? This was an industry where if you got off the boat and you maybe over the years accumulated just a little bit, just enough to rent a room, just enough uh, to get a contract from a manufacturer, because this is the beginning of department stores in New York City, which was so new and such a big shock that you actually had a kleptomania um, outbreak in the city because people were so unused to seeing all these goods. This is perfect for Manchester, actually, with all the outlets. Um, people were so unused to seeing all these goods arrayed out there. It was overwhelming. And you, you had uh, the invention of this idea of kleptomania. All of these women, including some women of means, who just, just couldn't help themselves, who were walking out of the stores. Um, those department stores needed someone to make all these clothes. And so what they did was they subcontracted. It wasn't like the big, the big mills of New England. Right? They subcontracted out. So this person has been off the boat, you know, a few years, um, rents a room, goes to, the, you know, goes to the docks, hires people right off the boats coming in from Europe, and brings them into this little room. Sometimes they provided a sewing machine, sometimes they didn't. And those sewing machines, You began to get electric sewing machines. Started out as pedals, but you began to get electric sewing machines in the early 20th century. So between 1900 and 1905, two things happened to the production of garments. One is that the speed doubled with the invention of with electric sewing machines, and the second is that it was de-skilled as a process. So what does de-skilled mean? De-skilled means that you broke down the task of making a garment into lots and lots of little tasks. My grandmother, who worked in the Triangle Factory, sewed buttonholes for 40 years. She just did the thread around the buttonhole again and again and again and again and again. It was de-skilled. And since it was de-skilled, you could pay very little. And with all those millions of immigrants coming into the country, you had a surplus of labor. And so who was hired very often Young girls, young girls and young women. And uh, Triangle itself, which was not a sweatshop, it was one of these new big modern factories, actually had a section they called the kindergarten, where they hired children as young as five to trim threads off the edge of garments to finish them. And they were so little they could fit in the barrels where the bolts of cloth came in case an inspector entered the factory. There weren't too many inspectors. There were some laws about child labor in those days, but you know, they were fairly toothless, as they are sadly today. Um, so you began to get very young children working in the factories. And uh, indeed, in New York City, in the garment centers in the early 20th century, first few years, when the family came over, it was actually easier for a daughter to get a job than a father because they thought men would strike. They thought they would organize unions. They thought they would strike, and they thought they would demand to be paid more. So you began to get the early ready-to-wear clothes in the United States were made in these, in these sweatshops, these little hole-in-the-wall rooms, you know, for some guy who had an order for, um, you know, 400 shirts from Macy's. And then you began to get, as people accumulated a little money in this industry, you began to get some new, some new factories. But the gospel of socialism and the gospel of union was brought to the United States with a lot of these immigrants coming from Eastern Europe at the time of the Russian Revolutionary, the beginning of the revolutionary activity, especially the 1905 revolution. A lot of people came after that. Coming from Southern Italy, at a time when Italy was unifying, and there was also a lot of, um, lot of anarchism, a lot of discussion of, of you know, farmers and peasants and workers owning their labor. So these families brought these ideas 
with them to the United States where they ran smack into a very vibrant moment in American socialism led by the former railway engineer Eugene Victor Debs who ran for president several times in the early 20th century. And the two, the, you know, the, the different European views and the American views, you have Irish nationalism and socialism, you have German, um, German Marxists coming in, you've got all kinds of different groups coming in and getting together with uh, this homegrown American trade unionism. Um, and it's really, you begin to get um, a, a really turbulent epoch of labor organizing. But nobody expected it from them. Nobody expected it from them. And then in the summer of 1907, very hot New York summer, when there was uh, a lot of evictions going on, people were being evicted from their houses, a little short depression, couldn't pay the rent, um, you got 400 of these working girls uh, went to camp on the Palisades above the Hudson River for the summer, get out of the sweltering heat of the Lower East Side and the overcrowding, and they began to talk about organizing the shops. And so they did. They came back to the city and they began to organize, back room by back room, factory by factory. And Triangle was one of the factories where they organized. And it was really interesting, you see the Yiddish banner and the English banner saying abolish slavery. These are young girls, most of whom had to drop out of school by the time they were 10, 11, 12, and go into the shops. But they used the shops to school themselves in American history. And they used the free libraries on the Lower East Side to school themselves in American history. And they really identified. They identified with the history of slavery. Because they experienced what I call in my first book, the shock of the shops. It was one thing to sew in the family house, to do work, to do chores. It was another thing to be on industrial time, to be tied to a machine. It felt different. You couldn't take breaks. You couldn't control your speed. It wasn't your father or your mother saying, now, you know, do this now, do this now. It was some overseer, um, and an overseer who perhaps, in the cases of young girls, wanted sexual favors in addition to everything else to keep your job. So, they really related to this idea of themselves as slaves, but also related to the, the need they felt that they were going to rise above this. And sometimes they taught themselves English in the shops, reading poetry aloud, reading Tennyson and Thomas Hood. There was a favorite poem called The Song of the Shirt. And they said it really appealed to us right, because they were looking at the, the British workers in an earlier period, British industrial workers in these poems, and they felt like this was... This was partly their story. That's how they educated themselves. So they wore those banners proudly. And on November 23rd, 1909, they went into the Great Hall of the People in Cooper Union, uh, in Cooper Square, um, between what's now the East and West Village in New York, but was really the Lower East Side then, and they had a gathering. And in this gathering, uh, they decided they were going to, you know, talk about striking. That's it. They were going to do it. And you know, Samuel Gompers of the American Federation of Labor and all these middle class women suffragists and everybody got on the stage and said, don't do anything rash. Don't do anything you'll regret. And then a 23 year old by the name of Clara Lemlich jumped up on the stage and she said, I am one of, this was in Yiddish, I am one of those girls who's being talked about today basically in the third person, I've suffered what's being described here, I move, we go on general strike. And everybody throws their hats in the air and raises their hands, and Benjamin Feigenbaum of the tiny, then tiny, International Ladies Garment Workers Union gets on the stage and he says, will you take the old Jewish oath, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may my hand wither, may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. And they're taking the oath, and everybody is shocked. And so the newspaper says the next day that these girls just calmly put down their scissors and walked away between the only thing standing between them and starvation. And no one knew what was going to happen. There you have it. The, the Hall of the People, Cooper Union, and Benjamin Feigenbaum is asking for the oath. And no one knew what was going to happen the next day. One thing I want to point out is those hats. Can you see the hats? It's a little blurry. But can you see that they're all wearing these big hats? They love those hats. They were, after all, teenage girls. They wanted to be fashionable. And they couldn't afford to buy the hats. They made their own hats. They made their own American style. 
which I think was really, was really interesting. And so they really, really, they valued those hats and they cared for them because they couldn't afford to make another one to make themselves look fashionable. But on that night, they threw them up in the air and they decided to strike. And the next morning, on the streets of the Lower East Side, there were a lot of people. They didn't know what was going to happen. It was cold. It was November. Um, but on every corner, there were people. And there were people who had to uh, spread the news from one place to the other. What you can't see about those girls is that they're wearing roller skates. <laughs> and they would go from one picket line to another, spreading news, and also ultimately selling a special edition of New York Socialist paper, the New York Call, um, to spread word um, about the strike. And it was printed in English, Yiddish, and Italian. Yeah, and you can see how young they are. Right? This is really a girls' uprising. It's a girls' strike. And a women's strike. You have some older women. The, you know, the, older, the older women, the, you know, the real grizzled hands in the trade were in their late 20s and early 30s. And there they are, Clara Lemlick in the middle, and the, the scarf and big hat. She's wearing a gray dress, and you can kind of see the dark scarf. The woman who started it all at the grand old age of 23. And what they are doing in holding arms like that is blocking scabs from getting into the workplace. Right? They are determined to stop um, other workers from being brought in by the manufacturers to break their strike. Uh, the resistance to those little lines uh, was pretty fierce. Clara, Clara had six ribs broken in the course of the strike. By, um, by police billy clubs and by private police, the Pinkertons, hired by the factory owners. Now, Clara worked in one of the new big um, factories called the Lyserson Shop. And another organizer of this strike, Pauline Newman, um, from Covno, Lithuania, was all of 18 when she was going around raising money. Come, she came up here, actually. She was raising money all over the Northeast to try to support these strikers. She came all the way up to Orford, New Hampshire, and parts of Vermont. Um, she was all of 18 at the time. Very young, very fierce. Okay, before we get to this. Now, one thing about this strike, one, two, two things to know. The police brutality didn't just fall on its leader, Clara Lemlick. It fell on a lot of these girls, and it was so severe that um, there's a famous uh, political cartoon of a young woman with her head bandaged, and the bandages are full of blood and she's being dragged into court by a policeman um, who successfully convinces the judge that she had beaten him, and she's charged with assaulting an officer. Um, and the magistrate says, you are on strike against God and nature. Women don't go out and walk picket lines. Women don't go out and parade themselves in public like that. You must be street walkers. And indeed, some of the manufacturers, along with hiring Pinkertons, hired and, and other strike breakers hired prostitutes to try to walk the picket lines along with the young women as a way of, of you know, tainting their reputations and, and trying to you know, put fear into them. They wouldn't be seen as good girls. And the response was really interesting. They said, better a street walker than a scab. At least it's an honest profession. <laughs> now, when it came time, there were upwards of 40,000 young garment workers on strike, most of them women, but not young girls and women, but not all of them, on strike um, in between November 1909 and, um, and February 2010, with all these little hundreds of little shops all over the city. And uh, eventually, one after the other, the manufacturers settled. But there was one thing that the union itself, which was, was uh, being led by um, the leadership was male, the organizers were male. Pauline Newman was hired only later, only during the course of the strike as, a, as an organizer. She wasn't allowed to negotiate. And when they negotiated, they said, you know, these, these young girls, these women, they have this really particular obsession with how dirty the shops are. Who cares if there's fabric on the floor? We have to give something away in negotiation. That's what we're going to give away. It's a silly, it's a silly feminine obsession. Well, the fabric that the popular shirtwaist, the most popular fashion of the day, was made out of was something called grass linen. It was shiny, it was stiff, and it was highly flammable. And the women who worked in the shops knew that. 
There had been smaller fires before. They had seen the way if someone dropped an ash, how quickly a piece of grass linen could catch. They tried to negotiate on this issue in a, in a new organization called the Women's Trade Union League, which was a cross-class organization of women workers and suffragists and the first generation of women college graduates. Tried to agitate on this issue. In the end, they were not successful. And so some shops cleaned up and most didn't. And in November 1910, there was a fire in a Newark garment shop. killed 26 young girls. You see them trying, you know, really futilely to, I'm sorry, this, this place is so big, usually you can see the pictures better, but um, you see firemen on some of these, some of these pictures aiming their, their hoses, but some of these new garment shops are big. They're the new modern buildings and the hoses don't aim high enough. So as in Triangle foreshadowing the terrible disaster that would come some months later, you have girls jumping out of the windows to escape the fire. And the Women's Trade Union League really tries to organize uh, later on around this issue. Now, the Triangle Factory was supposed to be something better. The Triangle Factory wasn't a sweatshop. It was a skyscraper. It was a big modern building. It was airy. Look how nice and modern. Look how clean. Look how light. Big windows. You were lucky to get a job at Triangle. Some of the more skilled workers, some of the more seasoned workers, it was great to get a job at Triangle. It wasn't one of these coal stove fed, you know, rooms where you could choke from the coal dust in the air and the smoke and the dust of linen. It was, it was pretty nice. And so Harrison Blank, the owners of Triangle, really didn't feel like they had to settle with the union. They said, we're just going to, we'll give you a raise. We'll talk about ours. But when the strike was over, we're not going to settle with the union. The big shops didn't. It was all the little shops that did. Lyserson and Triangle never did. And so there wasn't a lot of bargaining power because people really wanted those jobs. The building was supposed to be fireproof, the ash building. See, really, you know, big modern building, not a Lower East Side tenement. Right on Washington Square Park, the elegant Washington Square Park, where New York University was, and very affluent folk live in townhouses all around, just off the park. The building itself didn't burn. It just showed scorch marks. It was fireproof. Too bad the inside wasn't. Okay, so March 25th, 1911, somebody probably dropped the cigar ash on the eighth floor, and the fire spread so quickly, so quickly, that the smoke quickly filled the room. Now, the people on the ninth floor were lucky, because even then, this building was in the middle of NYU, and so they were able to get up on the roof, and NYU students helped um, hundreds of people jump across and get across with ropes to the next building, and they escaped. And the lower, the people who worked on the seventh floor were able to get down in the elevators. But the people who worked on the eighth floor, where the fire spread so fast that some, there were skele burnt skeletons found at sewing machines. That's how fast. Um, but as they rushed to the door, one of them was locked, and one of them, because it opened in, as people rushed the door and as they collapsed of smoke inhalation, the door became blocked by bodies, and they could, couldn't get out. Now, the, the elevator operators were heroic. There was this guy, Joe Zito, who went up and down so many times. You know, he was certainly responsible for saving more people individually than, than anyone else, but in the end, 140-something girls, 147 in the end, could not get out. And so they faced a terrible choice. Do you get out? How are you going to get out? The only way is out the window. And people were afraid of burning to death. So first they went out on the fire escape, but the fire escape collapsed. 
because it hadn't been inspected, it was old, it was one of the things they had tried to negotiate about, it was rusty, and it just fell to the ground, killing a number of people, and then they started to jump. And it only took a half hour, but because it was a warm spring day in the middle of New York City, um, before that half hour was out, there were probably 10,000 people watching this terrible tragedy as one girl after another jumped out of the window. And the police were some of the same police who had patrolled and arrested and even beaten up these girls two years earlier in the 1909 strike. And they were devastated because they recognized them. And so there was a degree of personal tragedy that struck so many sectors of, of New York's population. One thing you can see from looking at the bodies on the sidewalk is that many of them were burnt. Some of them were on fire as they came down. Right? So it's this, this terrible image. And they lay, on, they lay on the sidewalk. They lay on the sidewalk for days. And people from around the neighborhood came to try to identify their daughters and their sisters um, and their wives and their mothers and um, some of their sons. And um, there, were no, there were no older men, but there were a few. There were a handful. So to give you a sense of how this tragedy really, you know, really hit, it didn't just take place in this half hour. This is going on for days in the city of New York with people taking pictures and people writing articles. William Shepard um, was the journalist who um, wrote an article that has since been made into poems of Robert Pinsky and been made into operas because he's describing the sound. He's describing what it felt like as the bodies hit the street and how that no one who saw it would ever forget it. And then they moved the bodies to the pier on 26th Street to get them out of the middle of, of the city. And families who still had not found their relatives usually were able to find them there, as you can see from, um, from their grief in this photograph. It was a rainy day when they buried the victims. Families who identified their, um, their loved ones buried them on their own, but there was a funeral for the six who were never identified until actually 100 years later um, when a scholar by the name of Michael Hirsch set out trying to figure out who the last six victims were, and he did. So the six then unknowns were marched through the streets of New York in a funeral on a rainy day, and between four and 500,000 people lined the streets. All of it was, you begin to get a sense of how this was an epical moment, how this was a moment that changed so much. And you have the unions marching, ladies waist makers, waist and dress makers, we mourn our loss. We mourn our loss. And there was a young assemblyman, state assemblyman by the name of Al Smith, Irish guy who came from the Lower East Side, and he made it his business to visit every house that had lost someone. And so he visited, wasn't quite 147 families, 146 families, because some people lost, one poor man lost a wife and two daughters. So, um, but he visited every family, and it shaped forever how he saw this event. There was a social worker who lived around the corner from the Triangle Fire by the name of Francis Perkins, um, who became Al Smith's chief advisor in the years after the fire as he would uh, go on seven years later to become uh, the governor of, of New York. And Perkins watched the whole thing. And she decided she was going to spend the rest of her life working to ensure that this did not happen again, or at least did not happen as routinely as it did. You need to understand that three years after Triangle, as many people died in industrial accidents in the United States as died on the 
the battlefield in World War I that year. It was a terrible year for industrial accidents. And, and so she, she, she vowed to change things. Now, Blank and Harris were put on trial. And they were put on trial for having locked the door. The political sentiment in the city was fairly obvious. The guy who's holding the door shut as these young girls are on fire, turning to bones and, and uh, burning behind this door, the guy holding the door shut is wearing, um, he's wearing a suit made of dollar bills. These are the kinds of political cartoons that ran in the, in the papers around the country, actually, not just in the city, when um, Blank and Harris were put on trial. This is one of 100 murdered. Is anyone to be punished for this? And the sign says, operators wanted. As she's laying, she's laying dead in front of the sign that says, operators wanted, sewing machine operators wanted, knowing that you know, someone else is going to come in and need a job. All running during the trial. Here's the trial. You've got the coroner and the jury questioning employees about whether that door was locked. What happened in the trial shouldn't be that um, surprising in, um, in the age of, of the Trayvon Martin trial and other um, recent trials uh, where the victim was put on trial. Ultimately, what happened is that the victims were put on trial. They were described as you know, hysterical, bovine, cow-like was a word that was used to describe them, kind of sub-intelligent. They were, they were racially stigmatized as Jews and Italians and, and other kinds of Im immigrants as poor women. And in the end, and, and Blank and Harris hired a very sharp lawyer, Max Steuer, who was really able, he was kind of the, the hotshot lawyer of the day. Um, and he was able to put the victims on trial successfully. And in the end, um, Blank and Harris were acquitted. They couldn't prove that the door was locked. They brought in all these people who worked for them to testify that the doors were routinely open. And they ended up with a settlement of $75 uh, for each uh, family that lost someone. You know, it was certainly more money than it is today, but it was an insultingly small amount even then. Sarah Camistine, young girl who worked there, swore the doors were locked. But the people who, who said she was not believable ultimately triumphed. Here you have that, that picture um, of the bodies and the fire, and the fireman shows you know, a, a Burt building that's a question mark. It says, who is responsible? And that's the question that the country started to ask themselves, who is responsible? Well, who is responsible? Ultimately, the owners, but when Al Smith was elected governor of New York, in the aftermath of, of Triangle, New York created a factory investigating commission, which Smith and um, his colleague Robert Wagner in the state senate of New York pushed for. And in the years um, between 1911 and 1918, all the big industrial states created factory investigating commissions. And you began to have people, pa Francis Perkins hired some of these triangle workers to take Smith and Wagner in and out of um, factories all throughout the state, including um, canneries where women worked in upstate New York where they would have these ice blocked holes that were supposed to be the fire exits. And literally they would try to lead these guys into the holes. Um, so that they could, uh, they could see what would really be involved in getting out in case of fire. Industrial laws were passed across the country, state by state, New York, Massachusetts, Illinois, the states with the most factories. In 1928, um, when Smith ran for president of the U.S. unsuccessfully, he was Catholic baited, he was uh, you know, seen as a drinker in a time of prohibition. Uh, his protege, who had previously been a kind of callow New York State Senator by the name of Franklin Roosevelt, became governor of New York. And, um, and Roosevelt had had a really interesting experience, which is when he was recovering from polio in the early 20s, his wife Eleanor had brought some of these very garment workers to come meet with him. He was bored, he was interested in learning more about the world, um, and she brought a lot of people in and out of the house in Hyde Park that Franklin's mother Sarah was not too happy about. Um, but in the end, 
uh, David Dubinsky, the head of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, and also someone who became close with Franklin Roosevelt, said he came to really understand the conditions under which workers labored. Uh, he brought with him, when he was elected president in 1932, Francis Perkins, the eyewitness to the fire, who became his secretary of labor and the first woman cabinet minister, cabinet secretary, I guess, here. And, um, and Perkins became the architect of very important legislation of really directly growing out of Triangle, um, the Social Security Act, Workmen's Compensation, the Fair Labor Standards Act, which gave you the weekend uh, minimum wage, maximum hours, and the beginnings of uh, safety legislation with teeth. In the years after that, in the 1970s, safety legislation was made uh, even better, and you got the creation of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which actually created an infrastructure for investigating what was going on in American factories. And in the aftermath, uh, but, but after 1980, Occupational Safety and Health Administration regulations were somewhat gutted, and um, the number of inspectors became fewer and fewer, and continues uh, to be cut to this day. And the result was the next triangle. In 1990, 91, the Imperial Foods Chicken Plant in Hamlet, North Carolina, they were obeying the rules, right? They had, you know, fire door. Can you see the little padlock on it? September 3rd, 1991, fire spread through the plant. 25 workers died. 49 more were seriously injured. In the aftermath of the gutting of OSHA, no one had, had come ever to investigate this factory as you began to get you know, immigration and migration to many isolated parts of the country, including Vermont, it became much, much more difficult for a really, a really um, skeleton staff at OSHA to do um, the investigating. And you began to get the globalization of, of business, of things made in the United States. The worst industrial disaster until the Rana Plaza collapse in Bangladesh um, about a year ago was the Coder Industrial Toy Company fire in Thailand. 188 killed and nearly 500 wounded from the fire. Same experience, but it was taking place in Bangkok. It was taking place in parts of Thailand where um, no one could see and no one, and there was. I mean, how many of you ever heard of that fire? Yeah. I mean, this, this, you had, okay. Mostly not covered. Mostly, mostly no awareness of this in the United States. Well, you had Thai immigrants also coming into the United States in that era in an attempt to find themselves a better life. Um, and uh, you had another issue which went uninvestigated. This is a really interesting one. Um, for eight years, they were held in captivity literally forced to live in the factory, surrounded by barbed wire, you, begin, you began to get slave labor trade in the United States in the 1990s, just outside of Los Angeles. And so these women had been kept as slaves since 1987. And eventually, um, it was never, it wasn't even OSHA, it was, it was in, Immigration and Naturalization Service, who finally raided in 1995 and freed them, and they have gone on to become American citizens. Um, but it highlights to this day the difficulty of policing garment factories, because even in the United States, they're made, you know, in these little sweatshops and um, and made in ways that are that are hard to find unless there's a will. Okay, so Bangladesh. So you all know most of our clothes are not made. Most of our clothes are not made in the United States anymore. There are some still. But, um, I mean, you're all old enough to remember that, have you noticed that clothes have become cheaper, not, not more expensive? Everything else has become wildly more expensive. And clothing has become cheaper and cheaper. Crazily cheap. You know, $5 t-shirts? Well, there's a reason. And the reason is um, 
factory labor in, in Bangladesh, in Vietnam, in Ecuador. And you have a sense, there's really, there's a, there's a very famous picture that Lewis Hine took of child factory workers in a New England mill a hundred years earlier. And it's shocking how little the children are next to the mill. I'm really struck by how much that um, picture of a child working in a Thai garment factory, um, a Bangladesh garment factory really echoes that picture. That's how our clothes are made today. And there are triangles constantly. There are triangles constantly. This is Chittagong, 50 dead, 100 injured, 2006. And the pictures of families of, of rescuers removing the dead and families identifying their loved ones look an awful lot like triangle, but we never see coverage of it. And you have garment workers in the streets, shutting down city after city in Bangladesh by the tens of thousands. It was a protest involving 200,000 Bangladesh garment workers just a couple of years ago. They shut down traffic to get a raise, which they finally did, but it's, it's minuscule. They make less than garment workers anywhere in the world, which is why Walmart and Gap and the American military get their clothes made there because it's so inexpensive. They look so much like the Jewish and Italian young women of a hundred years earlier. The pictures could be almost the same. December 2000 and dead, the That's It garment factory. In August 2010, after tens of thousands of garment workers blocked highways, protested and rioted, Bangladesh garment workers, the lowest paid in the world, got a raise in minimum wage. They were supplying clothes to H&M, Zara, Walmart, Kohl's. At the That's It garment factory, doors were locked, and many of the hundred who died jumped to their deaths in the middle of a crowded city with thousands of people watching. The protests spread around the country. You hear nothing of this, absolutely nothing. There is no coverage. And there, this is actually a Nike factory in Malaysia, which had formed a union, um, which uh, Nike stopped. At this point in 2011, 2012, H&M, The Gap, Topshop, Old Navy, Zara, The Limited, and Abercrombie and & Fitch had all been shown to engage in unfair labor practices um, in uh, this part of the world. March 16, 2011, Bangladesh workers reached out to American workers. Workers of the world unite, fighting workers of the USA, we are with you, uphold the basic rights is the National Garment Workers Federation of Bangladesh. The man in the center um, was arrested and um, there were other garment leaders that were tortured and uh, killed because the Bangladesh government really likes all of this investment from overseas and doesn't want anything to mess it up. Flash forward to the 100th anniversary of the Triangle Fire in New York. The women in this picture are Chinese garment workers who um, made a second uprising of the 20,000, 30,000, 40,000. We talked about the 1909 uprising. They did theirs in 1982 when sweatshops had come back to the Lower East Side, but most of the garment workers were, um, were Caribbean and Chinese. They're now, they're older women now, but they marched and supported the memory of the strike. I love this one. Local, laborers Local 79 remembers Gussie Rosenfeld one of the victims of the Triangle Fire. It was at the 100th anniversary, was a day of labor awareness in the city of New York. Um, a number of, of people got together and, show, and sewed 146 shirtwaists with the names and ages uh, at death of all the victims of the fire. And they carried those shirtwaists through the city of New York that day. And then they laid the shirtwaist with all the names of the victims, 146 victims, at the base of the, of the Ash Building, which is now the NYU Brown Chemistry and Anthropology Building. And people looking out the windows, they had no idea what was going on. 
And the signs say, we still mourn the dead, but we fight for the living. No more sweatshops. I am remembering history. I am making history. And one of the, one of the ways the triangle is commemorated is that um, people spread, go to the, the homes of each of the victims and make an impromptu memorial with chalk every year on March 25th. And this is my daughter and a friend of hers, and they're remembering Bertha Wendorf, 18 years old, lived at 205 Henry Street, died March 25th, 1911, Triangle Factory. And what was really interesting is you had folks living in the neighborhood now, which was largely Chinese, many of whom had relatives who were garment workers, crossing over the chalked memorials and, and engaging and talking about that history and also talking about their own experiences. They started talking to the people who were chalking about the conditions they, they worked under now. It was really quite remarkable. This is Cooper Union. See those columns? Again, the Great Hall of the People, where the 100th anniversary of Triangle was observed. And what was really interesting is you had people who worked in the most dangerous professions in the world now. Um, and not only from Bangladesh, but here in the United States, coal miners, taxi drivers who face a level of violence that's almost unimaginable. One of the taxi driver organizers took his shirt off and showed his back, and there were so many wounds from you know, being stabbed, from all of the things that people had attempted to do to him in his cab. So taxi drivers, um, coal miners, catfish workers in Mississippi today, really, really dangerous. Um, dangerous work, dangerous lines. And in an amazing moment, that little red-haired woman on the bottom is Clara Lumlick's daughter. And Kaplona Akhtar, the um, leader of the Bangladesh garment workers, came to meet her. And in this amazing moment, 2011, met 1911, as she came um, and spoke with um, Rita Margulies, the daughter of, of Clara Lumlick. And you know, she, affirmed, she honored, Kaplona Akhtar honored Clara Lumlick for what she had done, and, and Margulies um, you know, committed herself to working on safety issues today. So what are the issues today? Um, the issues today are that um, there is uh, an attempt to pass uh, an international safety accord. And uh, it was uh, started by a group called the International Labor Federation, International Labor uh, Rights Organization. There are a couple of international labor groups that wanted to create um, uh, factory safety standards. And um, only after the Rana Plaza collapse, since this time, which killed 1,200 workers and is now the biggest industrial disaster um, in the history of garments, only after that did the European firms agree to sign. So it started with the European firms, H&M, Zara, Topshop. They all signed. American firms just did not want to sign. Um, the first, interestingly, to sign, and they signed very quickly, um, was Philips Van Heusen, um, which is the brand that um, is, uh, creates a lot of other clothing. I mean, there is the Philips Van Heusen label, but it's also Tommy Hilfiger um, and American Apparel and a number of um, recognizable brands. They signed right away. Um, most American firms continued to hold out for a very, very long time. The Japanese came in next, Uniqlo, and some of the Japanese producers signed on to the safety accords. Gap and Walmart and the U.S. military have yet to sign. And the reason they don't sign is because of one simple thing, which comes back to inspectors. The, 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 the sticking point is that um, the International Labor Federation wants independent inspectors. They want, they want the workers to be able to appoint inspectors who will come in and judge whether conditions are safe or not. And then they're bound to make the repairs. And interestingly enough, Gap and Walmart, which kind of represent rather different ends of, um, of the consumer base in some ways, um, are leading the charge against that. Uh, Congress attempted to require the U.S. military. There was, there was a bill introduced in Congress about a month ago to try to require the U.S. military to have uniforms produced under safe conditions. Um, and, uh, and the bill was defeated in Congress. But this is a very current issue. 
It's very much alive right now. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's hard to figure out who to boycott. Abercrombie and Fitch um, were one of the first to sign on. They have many other things wrong with them. Um, but their clothes are produced safely. So um, I'm going to stop there because there probably are questions. But that's my 100 years from then to now and, and the ways in which they echo each other. So probably questions, thoughts, issues? Yes. This lady asked if anyone has tried to pass a bill um, requiring the clo clothing be marked as to where it's made. Um, most clothing is. Most clothing is. But knowing where it's made, one of the things Kaplona Octor did when she came to New York in March 2011 is she had everybody in the room look at the label on the shirt or pants of the person next to them. So before you go to bed tonight, look at your label. <laughs> most of it's not going to be made in the United States. Um, and the conditions really vary. And that's one of the reasons the International Labor Federation said, we can't just do Bangladesh. We can't just say, oh, one country has to fix their factories. We have to, say, we have to go from the retailers. If you have a retailer of the scope of, of a Gap or a Walmart saying, we won't buy clothing made under unsafe conditions, the conditions will improve because the business is so colossal. So yeah, I mean, mostly, mostly clothing is properly labeled as far as where it's made. But it's only part of the story. Yeah, um, my grandmother worked at Triangle. She was not there during the fire. <laughs> she, worked there, she worked there for a long time. Um, but uh, she, was, she, had already, she had already had her first two children by the time of the fire. And she was, she was, was working at home with young children. She was about to. Um, Open a, open a tavern in the basement, which was the, the other thing that she did before she went back to sewing buttonholes later on. Um, but, but Triangle was, what's really interesting is that um, Triangle remains deeply personal to a lot of families. And so during the, when, when people were marching down Fifth Avenue in New York with the um, shirtwaist with people's names on them, I saw twice Someone come over and say, could I carry that? That's my great aunt. Or that's my, that's, you know, my great grandmother. And I want my kids. I brought my, one guy said, I brought my kids up from North Carolina because I wanted them to see, see her, her shirtwaist. So very, very, there's a lot of family lore. Interestingly, there's so much family lore about it. It's so important in the collective memory um, of certain, you know, formerly immigrant populations uh, that I know, I, I heard about someone who's, thinking of writing a book about people who told their um, kids and grandkids they worked in Triangle when they didn't, <laughs> because it has become so, so central. So that's a, whole, that's a whole other story that we can begin to take apart. But. I mean, I think one of the most important things that happened after that, one of the times I gave this talk, um, there was a, a, a fireman, very knowledgeable kind of fire officer uh, in, the, in the building. And he was talking about the really detailed codes that were put into place after Triangle, including um, that you have to have doors that open out in buildings where you have mass spaces. Now, older buildings don't have them. It's always very effective in my classrooms at Dartmouth because the building I teach in does not have doors that open out, right? And it's very easy to show, go over and show as the door, you know, the door slams into the door frame and you can't move it, right, if someone collapses against it. So simple things. He said that actual change saved a lot of lives. We don't know how many lives it saved because people could get out. These doors, these doors open out. Right? That, is, that is the norm for any, and it's required. It's the law for any more modern building with a, with a big space. So um, building codes, yeah, building owners are then required to build buildings up to code. But, you know, you saw that, you saw, if you don't inspect it, you saw the Hamlet, you saw the Hamlet fire door, right? Fire, fire door don't lock with a padlock on it. You have to have inspectors. Yes, OK. The union paid for the, the burials of the six. Um, and the $75 each was meant to pay for funeral expenses when, when the triangle owners settled. So that was, that was from the Blank and Harris settlement, because most of these families had, you know, everybody in the family worked. <laughs>
which was the norm in the U.S. at that time. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. The trial, the trial lasted a few months, and then the settlements came through. So the families uh, probably had borrowed money from um, their local town societies. Um, the the Landsmannschaften for, for Jewish families and other kinds of town societies for um, people from, from Italy and Ireland. Um, usually you could borrow money, and sometimes local politicians. Um, it is my understanding that Al Smith also worked on, on that issue. It's so interesting. Did you, all, did you all hear that? She was saying that the, the lore of the fire was part of, part of her family history. So many families, I think. It's really interesting to me. Um, ha there's something about this fire that touches people, and, and that is so, is so important to this 100 years later. Um, and, and, and it's so important for us to think about these other fires, um, which are as devastating. Yeah. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know. I think it did. Um, but, uh, but I'm not sure. I have to go back and look at that. Um, I know it was, it was covered a little bit, um, and there were sponsors both in, in the Senate and the House uh, who, were, who were trying to get, I think it was Jan Schakowsky in Chicago in Congress who sponsored it, and Barbara Boxer in the Senate. And um, it was really, really disturbing to hear the person who was the buyer for the U.S. military say they couldn't afford you know, to the, it, that if the safety regulations were passed, that they would have to buy somewhere else. That just seemed, that just seemed incredible for, you know, a military that buys, you know, planes that cost, I, I don't know how much. So it's really, it, it's very disturbing. But again, this, this issue is not dead in Congress. Um, it will come back. So keep, keep your eyes on that. Yes. Um, in, you know, I think these safety accords are key. I do think it's key for retailers to sign on. Um, and so one way to do that is definitely to let retailers know, right, why you're shopping in one place and not another. Yeah, boycotts, you know, you can, you can do it. Um, but the second, you can't just boycott, you have to tell them. <laughs> you have to tell them why you're not going into the Gap anymore like I did because all my clothes are, you know, were Gap for years. Um, but also I think, I think the U.S. government, these kinds of regulations would make a huge difference um, if the U.S. government weighed in, yeah. Oh, you mean, was it some sort of payback? I don't think so, because relatives, actually the owner of the factory lost a relative um, in the fire, although, you know, certainly they were brutal men, really interesting. When I did this talk in Montpelier a couple of years ago, the grandson of, um, of one of the factory owners, um, I think it was Harris, Isaac Harris, was there, and the librarian said to me, look, you know, you might have some hostility, and... Um, but instead, what he wanted to do was tell me um, how brutal the manufacturers continued to be after Triangle. And um, his father told him the story of how um, his grandfather and his partner, Blank, years later in the 30s, um, would try to break uh, unions in the industry by a cab would be going down Fifth Avenue or one of the long avenues in New York. They'd grab a union organizer, take him into the cab, break an arm throw him out of the cab. So interestingly, his, his understanding of, um, you know, his family lore was not sympathetic to his grandparents. So who knows? I suppose, I suppose they, might, they might have been capable. One interesting bit of that story, the grandson of Isaac Harris ended up on a commune in California in the 1960s where he fell in love, unbeknownst to him, with the granddaughter of Al Smith. They were together for a number of years. Um, she was tragically killed in a biking accident, but I thought, wow, you really couldn't make this up. If I had written that in a novel, people would say that is just too much, simply not believable. Um, the, this woman asked how much the students know about Triangle and, 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 and that we don't teach labor history. Those are two separate things. So Triangle is taught. Triangle is taught as a tragedy that people can relate to. And, and um, I, you know, when I, for years I did these um, professional development workshops with high school teachers and junior high school teachers, and they said Triangle is one of the best ways of teaching about the progressive era, of teaching about reform in a way that's relatable, right? And, and that gives it a human face. And so it's very widely taught in public schools, um, but that's not the same as teaching the union story that came first um, or, or, or talking about the role of unions in keeping workers safe. Um, uh, one labor educator I met in the course of all this triangle work said that 
She has to spend all of her time getting people over their bad views of unions before she can even tell the story. That people come in with these terrible feelings about unions and convinced that they're, you know, I mean, our own student newspaper a few years ago during a union battle on campus, you know, wrote that everyone knows that unions are bad for the economy and bad for workers. It's like, okay. Um, so, I mean, I think that's a big issue, and they're, and they're separate. Um, I think, you know, you've been talking about skyscrapers. There's just only so high you can raise a ladder on a truck. You know, and, and if you think to the terrible tragedy of 9-11 so many years later, um, and you had, you know, you had people, you had images. I remember watching it because it, it, it evoked triangle in my mind. You had burning bodies, you know, falling out of the building. There's no way that they could have possibly had fire equipment that reached up, you know, to the upper floors of the World Trade Center. And in 1911, it seemed almost as impossible. You know, there were, you know, again, the, the equipment reached, reached as far as it reached. I think um, that, uh, Again, doors that opened out, fire escapes that didn't collapse, that would have made a difference. If the fire escapes and ladders that reached to the ground and the fire escapes didn't fall off the building, um, you know, it would have saved a lot of lives. And so one of the things that happened after that is fire escapes had to be inspected um, with a great deal more regularity. But I want to point out that that is not the case today. Right? That, that um, occupational safety and health inspections, there were, you know, there were deaths um, you know, in Windsor, Vermont, not that long ago, in a factory that simply was not inspected um, with, any, with any regularity because there's almost nobody left on the OSHA staff. So all things that, that actually are doable and can be done. Yes, it was great that she was there. It, would, it make, made a huge difference for, you know, the history of the country and worker safety. She was talking about Frances Perkins and the role she played. And a final, yes. Well, the Chinese workers in New York have been incredibly effective. I mean, and they were really interesting because um, they uh, were almost all mothers. They were a little older. Um, and one of their big issues was child care because they brought children into the shops and children were sometimes injured in the shops. And, you know, the union leadership, Jay Mazur, I think, was head of the union at that time. He was still not on board with this, with this issue. And the, they women, the women brought their babies in and, you know, put them on his desk. They basically had a cry in. Um, in, in his office with their babies. And they ended up creating this amazing eight-story building called the Chinatown Garment Center Daycare Program. And, uh, and it's amazing. They have schools and nurseries and they have, you know, art classes and dance classes and um, health clinics. And so um, I, think, I think that they were incredibly effective at that point, in, you know, in the 80s and 90s, you had a quarter of a million people a day in New York working in sweatshops to make clothing. Now that it's been so utterly globalized, um, you, you know, I don't think you have the same number. So you know, the union is, is still potent in the United States, but clothing isn't made in the US to the same degree. You know, there, were, there were thoughts, but um, it seems to be um, a cigar ash. It seems to have been just someone was being careless and smoking in those buildings. Yes? So that's the whole idea. I remember hearing that the doors were locked. Yes. Well, also, yeah, they, they wanted to prevent, the doors were locked supposedly to prevent theft and also, um, you know, to prevent workers from going to the bathroom and taking breaks when they weren't, hadn't asked. Right? You had this, you know, this schedule that, that had to be kept. So, um, you know, again, I don't know. I mean, there were fires all the time. And, you know, some of them may well have been intentional. Certainly, there were many intentional fires by failing business owners, you know, but uh, they weren't really failing. They were, pretty, they were pretty robust, a robust shop. And uh, so I, I think probably the fire was an accident, although, um, if you, you, know, you listen to the speeches that were made after the fire by, by labor leaders, um, they said this is akin you know, to, medieval, to medieval torture. I mean, in the end, we, we allow our workers to be tortured you know, for the sake of producing um, inexpensive products and for, and for profit. And uh, that's very much what Kaplona Akhtar you know, said about, said about the conditions in Bangladesh when, when she came to New York. It's, it's not so different. So. Thank you, guys.